It must have come as quite a shock. It's not often our entire conception of life itself is overturned. But on February 15, 1977, for a small group of explorers in the deep-sea submersible Alvin, it happened. That day, they were descending to the Galapagos Rift, a hydrothermal vent formed from the gradual separation of two tectonic plates in the eastern Pacific Ocean. It was close to midnight, just on the equator, though in the timeless darkness and cold two and a half kilometers down, such considerations were for another world. The navigator informed the three crewmen on the submersible to look out for some clams that had been observed on a prior scouting dive, which obviously had been dumped from some passing ship. Nothing could survive at such depths, so far from the sun on which all life ultimately depended. The deep sea, everyone knew, was a blank azoic desert. But as the team descended, they saw that the clams the previous dive had glimpsed were not isolated castaways. They were the outermost members of a colony of hundreds, some nearly a foot long, and all very much alive. And they were no fluke. What the team had stumbled across was an entire ecosystem, seemingly independent of the sun and its light. A Lovecraftian garden of alien wonder, all surviving in water approaching 80 degrees Celsius and saturated with noxious gas. Dominating the scene were strangely beautiful creatures that looked like flowers, but were in fact worms living in tubes of secreted chitin. Their vivid petals owed their redness to hemoglobin, which they used to extract vitalizing gases from the water. Subsequent dives would find translucent shrimp and eels, and ghostly transparent octopuses, all unique to this hellish environment. There were no biologists on that expedition, because no one assumed there would be any biology to observe. But in 1979, a team of biologists arrived at the rift to attempt to explain these seemingly impossible animals. Eventually, they determined that, just as life on Earth's surface is ultimately dependent on photosynthetic plants, so this alternate ecosystem ultimately depended on primitive microscopic organisms that fed on hydrogen sulfide and other compounds emerging from the vents, converting them into energy, which was then either consumed or symbiotically utilized by animals further up the chain. This chemosynthesis provided an alternate method for the sustenance of life, one that did not require proximity to the sun. And that very year, in the depths of space, two hardy craft would reveal a potential paradise for such life, located in one of the most inhospitable regions of the universe. If you might, for a moment, indulge me a further detour into history, it was around the turn of the year 1610 that an Italian professor named Galileo Galilei had the revolutionary idea of repurposing a new instrument called the telescope to observe the sky. Among the first objects this instrument revealed to him were four errant stars in orbit around the planet Jupiter, along with sunspots and the craters on the moon, which showed that the worlds beyond Earth were not perfect and infallible, as had been taught since the time of Aristotle. These new stars, which he called the Medician stars, after his patron, Cosimo de' Medici, were the first direct evidence against the ancient geocentric conception of the universe. It may seem trivial today, but they were the first evidence that not everything in the universe orbited around the Earth, a discovery Galileo would later compound by observing that the planet Venus has phases like the Moon, something that could only occur if it orbited the Sun. Galileo's discovery of the first moons ever found around another planet would be momentarily overshadowed by that eternal plague of science, a credit controversy. A German astronomer named Simon Marius claimed to have discovered them before him, leading Galileo to accuse him of plagiarism. Since Marius was slow to publish his findings, it is impossible to verify who was correct. Today, we all but universally call these four moons the Galileans, while Marius has credit for the world's individual names, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, after lovers of Jupiter. Since the guy got around quite a bit, this would prove a useful naming convention. Those names would, however, fall out of favor for much of later history, since, for those astronomers following Galileo, the moons would remain just indistinct points. Newton would teach us their density, and thus their likely makeup, predictably a mixture of ice and rock, while in 1892, the legendary astronomer Edward E. Barnard managed to glean surface variations on Io, variations confirmed almost a century later. By the mid-20th century, the spectrograph would confirm the existence of water ice on all of the Galileans save Io. And that, by the time of Alvin's dive, was the sum total of human knowledge regarding the largest moons of Jupiter. 
Even the Pioneer probes, the first spacecraft to visit Jupiter, barely resolved them beyond indistinct disks. But the Pioneers were only the opening act, paving the way for their far more capable successors, the Voyagers, and what they would reveal would send astronomers and biologists into a frenzy for decades and raise profound existential questions that to this day remain incompletely resolved. The Voyager program was born of a realization made in 1964 by Gary Flandro, a young student at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Asked to calculate a possible path to Jupiter, he found that for a brief period beginning in 1977, the four gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, would be in a near conjunction only seen once every 175 years. This would allow a spacecraft arriving at Jupiter to use gravity assists to slingshot itself at ever greater speeds, first to Saturn, then Uranus, and then Neptune. The giants were intended to be the stars of this mission. After the relative disappointments of Mars, Venus, Mercury, and our own moon, the Voyager team expected any moons they visited to be cold, cratered, and dead. Geologists were not even part of the initial team. That would soon change. The first upending shock was Jupiter's innermost moon, Io. Far from the bland, cratered surface they had expected, Io was a wild flash of livid orange, red, yellow, and black, pockmarked with strange holes that were obviously not impact craters. One team member said he didn't know what was wrong with Io, but that it might be helped with a course of penicillin. And then, on March 9, 1979, a young navigation engineer named Linda Heider glanced at one of the raw images recently downloaded from Voyager 1, which she initially took to be of another moon emerging over its limb. But there was nothing in Io's line of sight. Whatever it was must have emerged from Io itself. She later determined that the prominence she observed coincided with a dark spot on Io's surface, indicating that it had to be a volcanic eruption, the first ever seen on a world beyond Earth. In fact, her initial image contained two simultaneous eruptions, each nearly a tenth Io's diameter. If such eruptions were scaled up to Earth, they would reach three times the height of the International Space Station. That a body the same size as our geologically dead moon could be the most volcanically active object in the solar system seemed inconceivable at first, but it had been predicted. The orbits of Io, Europa, and Ganymede are locked in a precise 1 to 2 to 4 resonance. That is, for every one orbit Ganymede makes, Europa makes two and Io four. And, as always happens when objects fall into orbital resonances, they each provide the other with a series of small gravitational kicks, often described as analogous to pushing a child on a swing at just the right moment to go higher. These gravitational tugs keep the orbits of the moons elongated, preventing Jupiter's gravity from easing them into pleasant, comfortable circles. As a result, Io and Europa are subject to massive variations in Jupiter's gravitational pull. When closer to Jupiter, the planet's vast gravity tugs on them more. When farther away, it tugs on them less. The gravitational pull of our own small moon tugs at Earth hard enough to raise and lower the entire ocean by half a meter every day, creating what we call the tide. And Jupiter is not our moon. It is 25,000 times more massive with a gravitational pull strong enough to raise Io's rocky surface by as much as 100 meters. In a paper published in the journal Science, three days before Voyager's closest approach to Jupiter, a team of physicists calculated that the friction raised by such tidal kneading would be enough to melt Io's interior, leaving temperatures thousands of degrees at the surface. By a freak of gravity, Jupiter, a largely inert hulk incapable of shining by its own light, was imparting enough energy to its innermost moon to all but tear it apart. The gravitational torture of Io was top of the Voyager team's mind when they turned their eyes to Jupiter's second moon, Europa. They already knew that Europa, unlike Io, was composed largely of ice. Would they see geysers of water erupting from the surface? Unfortunately not. Where Io had shocked with its fiery rage, Europa stunned with its stillness. A delicate, almost perfect sphere. It resembled nothing so much as a pale, iridescent marble. Its surface was an overwhelmingly white expanse of water ice, and almost completely devoid of topography. Indeed, Europa is the smoothest object in the solar system, with few of the signs of cosmic violence visible elsewhere, including its sister moon Callisto. A surface so smooth had to be very young, 
perhaps just 50 million years. The only features visible on its surface were tarry lines that looked as if they had been scribbled on the world with a fine-tipped pen. It did not escape the notice of the Voyager team that these lines, they are literally called linnae, or lines, bore a striking resemblance to Arctic pack ice. Could they be floating over a subterranean ocean of liquid water? It was an almost surreal proposition. Europa? An abode of life? The tiny snowball was smaller than our own moon. Its icy surface was exposed to the vacuum of space, frozen harder than granite by the intense cold, and bathed in radiation from Jupiter's magnetosphere strong enough to kill a human in hours. On the surface, Mars was a vibrant paradise by comparison. And yet, the idea was not entirely absurd. The same tidal heating effects that so tormented Io were also affecting Europa to a lesser extent, a mere 30 meters of distortion as opposed to 100. Still, enough to keep Europa's interior molten. After all, it takes far less energy to melt ice than rock. It would explain Europa's pristine, unblemished surface, water welling up from the depths like lava, covering over any imperfections. On Earth, there exists a cast-iron rule. Where there is liquid water, there is life. No matter how infinitesimal the traces may be, if there is enough to support even a single cell, then the cell will exploit it. If Europa did indeed possess an ocean of liquid water, could the same be true there? The explorers in the Galapagos Rift had shown that life could exist and even thrive in the pitch blackness beyond the reach of the sun. Could the black abyss of Europa's ocean, believed to be as much as a hundred kilometers deep, be home to similar weird wonderlands as those seen by the Alvin team? Such an ocean would comprise more water than all the oceans of the Earth combined. On our planet, the oceans never descend farther than 11 kilometers deep, though Europa's far weaker gravity means the pressures at the bottom would be comparable to those in our deepest regions. The idea that an alien biosphere completely separate from our own may exist just a few AU away from our planet ignited the wider imagination of humanity. Arthur C. Clarke was so taken with the idea that he made it the centerpiece of his sequel novel, 2010. But for such an extraordinary claim, further proof was still needed. The few snapshots offered by the Voyagers would never settle the issue. We needed to establish a more permanent residence around the giant planet. Enter Galileo. The Galileo spacecraft was the follow-up to the Voyager missions, and was intended not as a flyby of the Jupiter system, but as a long-term orbiter that would delve deeper into the mysteries the Voyagers revealed. Galileo launched in 1989, the year that Voyager 2 made the program's final flyby, Neptune. Despite being crippled when an overambitious antenna failed to open properly, the craft managed to succeed in its mission to reveal Jupiter and its moons in unprecedented detail, as well as study the system's complex magnetic field. Before being sent to a fiery death in the depths of Jupiter's atmosphere, Galileo would orbit the planet for 14 years, and the star of the mission was undoubtedly Europa. Close-up images of the cracks in Europa's surface lent credence to the idea that it was liquid water, rather than simply warm ice, that was shaping Europa's geology, as it showed what appeared to be icebergs broken off from the cracks and immediately frozen in place. But the true revelation came from studying the moon's interaction with Jupiter's magnetosphere. Bar the sun, Jupiter has the strongest magnetic field in the solar system. If it were visible, it would be larger than the moon in our sky. Its power excites particles from the moon's surfaces, energizing them into belts of radiation similar to Earth's Van Allen belts, only tens of thousands of times stronger. Because Jupiter's magnetic field is tilted relative to its axis by about 10 degrees, it occasionally rises above or below the plane of the moon's orbits, causing the field strength at the surfaces to vary. Because a varying magnetic field can induce a magnetic field in a conductive substance, like, say, salt water, the discovery that Europa had such an induced field was for many the clinching proof that it possessed a subterranean ocean. But that was not all. Galileo also showed that Ganymede and Callisto possessed induced magnetic fields, indicating that they too might have subsurface oceans. This was particularly striking in the case of Callisto, whose surface is as fossilized, eroded, and crater-scarred as that of Mercury. Any ocean Callisto possessed would have to be buried so deep that it had never interacted with its surface. For Ganymede, the case is different. Ganymede is the largest moon in the solar system, larger indeed than Mercury. Its surreal surface is believed to be the result of processes analogous to tectonic plates on Earth, albeit composed of water ice rather than rock. The tectonic activity is ancient, frozen for eons. 
Ganymede's eccentricity is too small to produce significant tidal heating, but it is possible that at some time in the not-too-distant past, say, when our ancestors first crawled out of the sea, that the moon passed through a stronger resonance with one of its neighbors, causing its eccentricity to increase and Jupiter's gravity to act on it. Interestingly, detailed studies of Ganymede's induced magnetic field suggest that it may actually have more than one ocean, sandwiched between different solid layers. By the way, just to confuse things even more, Galileo discovered that Ganymede also has a magnetic field of its very own. Given that Mars, which is larger, does not, this is odd, though it is possible that the same period of tidal flexing that broke up Ganymede's surface also left enough energy in its iron core to keep it molten. Jupiter's moons form a neat parallel to the fates of the planets in the inner solar system, though with the energy source being tidal force rather than sunlight. Io, which came too close to the source of energy and as a result descended into hell, is analogous to Venus. Ganymede, which drifted too far from the energy source and so froze for eternity, is akin to Mars. Perhaps Europa could be Earth, happy resident of the Goldilocks zone, neither too much energy nor too little. In 2012 and 2016, the Hubble telescope detected what may be evidence of the long sought after water geysers on Europa, recording possible plumes up to 200 kilometers high. But if Europa did have such an ocean, what form of life could it possibly hold? The vent dwelling creatures of the Galapagos Rift may not have needed to subsist on plant life, but they still breed the oxygen plants produced, and so were ultimately dependent on the sun. The only completely sun independent creatures in the community were the bacteria. Given this, many suspect that if Europa does have a biosphere, such bacteria will be the full extent of it. Without oxygen, life simply cannot get complex. But there are other sources of oxygen besides plant life. Europa's surface is awash with radiation, which frequently ionizes the water ice in its crust, splitting it into hydrogen and oxygen. Light hydrogen flees away into space, but the heavier oxygen stays behind in a very tenuous atmosphere around the moon. This atmosphere could impregnate the ice with oxygen or peroxide. Then, in a process similar to subduction on Earth, the ice could be forced downward by another overriding ice flow, sending the oxygen-bearing ice into the depths below. After just 12 million years, this process could deliver as much oxygen to Europa's ocean as exists in our own. There could be no limit to what we may find down there. Needless to say, a dedicated mission to Europa has had NASA scientists straining at the leash for decades. Despite the mountain of evidence for Europa's ocean, it still has not been directly confirmed. If it were, and in particular, if samples could be taken from it, say via an erupting plume, then exobiology would become a science overnight. Plans to send a probe to the moon were trapped in development hell for nearly 20 years, before finally, in 2013, the US Congress approved the Europa Clipper, expected to arrive in the Jupiter system sometime in the early 2020s. At $2 billion, the Clipper will be a grand mission in the mode of Galileo or Cassini, and will be hard targeted on one objective, finding an ocean under the surface of Europa. A multispectral infrared camera will search for any hot plumes that may make their way to the surface. A spectrometer will probe for life-friendly organics. And of course, an ice-penetrating radar system will map the ocean directly, if it is there. Accompanying the Clipper, though at a time lag, will be the European Space Agency's Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, or JUICE. Yeah, I know, it doesn't work, just go with it. A less focused mission than the Clipper, JUICE will perform scans of Jupiter's three icy moons before settling into orbit around Ganymede. It will probe for oceans under the moon's surface using a combination of gravity field mapping and magnetometry. But even that will not sate the true dreamers. Almost as soon as Europa's ocean was first suspected, a plan for the ultimate unmanned journey had been forming in the minds of NASA's blue sky thinkers. Such a mission would not only consist of an orbiting craft and a lander, but a probe designed to melt through the kilometers of ice with a radioactive heater, and then, upon contact with the ocean below, release an autonomous rover that would search the dark depths for signs of life. Such a rover would have to operate entirely without human guidance and would therefore require next-level artificial intelligence. It would have to be sterilized to a level of which we are not currently capable, since even the slightest hint of terrestrial biota would not only completely invalidate any findings by the probe, but might also cause us to inadvertently wipe out an entire ecosystem with a dose of Terran plague. If, however, these hurdles could be overcome, 
then the Europa Diver could be the moon landing of this generation. A dry run is already in the planning stages. With the information provided by the Clipper, NASA hopes to next send a lander in an area where the ocean comes closest to the surface, equipped with a drill to sample the water below. Preliminary studies are already underway, particularly around Lake Vostok, a gigantic lake buried under miles of Antarctic ice, separated from the surface for as long as 15 million years. It has already been successfully drilled by Russian scientists, though no pristine water samples have yet been retrieved. Please join me next episode, where I will be exploring the icy realms of Saturn and speculating on life, both as we know it and not. <laughs>